If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Get into our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for joining us for another edition of Christian Answers. I'm the director of Christian Answers, and I'm with our director of research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Steve, it's great to have you here as usual. Thank you, Larry. You did a lot of hard uh, research, a lot of uh, painstaking research on early church history. Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, what did that entail, uh, just briefly for our audience? Well, there are uh, between 41 and 4,200 pages in English uh, of all of the writings that we have of the uh, early church writers prior to 325 A.D. Uh, I have read every page of them, uh, some multiple times, and I've cataloged uh, what they believed, uh, what they experienced, and, and what they practiced uh, during those times, and I'm going to share the summary of, of the results with, with the listeners. In fact, uh, speaking of all that research, now you're, uh, where do you find, if someone's out there hearing this and they wanted to kind of just verify what you're talking about is true, where, what are your sources for that? What, what, did you go to some books? Is there a, yeah, when, a title of a book? When, when, well, there are two independent ways of verifying. Uh, one is you can go on the web, on a website. It's called www.ccel.org, and they have the text of almost all of the early church writers. Uh, a, a few of them, such as Adamantius, they don't have, but they have the others. If you want to look at it in print, uh, we recommend a book called, uh, actually it's a series, a 10-volume series called Anti, A-N-T-E, uh, Anti-Niacine Fathers, by Hendrickson Publishers. And also the uh, statistics and, and the, the summaries and totals are uh, on, uh, on my website. And you can find them at, at www.historycart.org uh, slash church history. And, um, and you can see all of the, the graphs that we'll have, not the, the, the charts we'll have in future shows will be out there. Right. So that's just a quick reference for our viewers out there to show that uh, that material is available. It's available right on your computer. You can also get the, the books in print. Uh, you mentioned Hendrickson. Hendrickson's publishers, yes. which uh, you can go online and find them on the internet, just like these other things to get your hands on books. There's also other big Christian book publishing companies that offer these books for you to get your hands on. What we've done in this series is through uh, S Steve's hard work and research is we're kind of uh, making it easy for you out there in a to where you can just get this information in a distilled fashion without having to spend all the time like Steve had to do, uh, where it'll be there for you uh, when you're uh, getting into research that deals with uh, all the attacks against Christianity that you're going to have to deal with as a Christian in this day and age. And that's one reason Christian Answers is here. But basically, I'm an evangelist, and I go out and preach the gospel out in you know, university campuses, you know, on television, on the radio, on the internet, our, our YouTube videos, I'm debating all types of people. But as a Christian in this day and age, you're going to find that most people just do not accept Christianity. They say it's been changed over the years, it's, it's all messed up, and, and things of that nature. So uh, a series like this dealing with the early church and what they believe, uh, you as a Christian out there can uh, use this type of material to show that what we believe today here in the 21st century actually uh, matches back to the early church uh, the fathers, the, the you know Acts chapter 2, if you want to really go back to the early church. Uh, it matches uh, now as then. 
And the evidence is there. And that's what this series is all about. And Steve and his research will be showing us just that. And now, this is part two in our series on early church. And we're sort of doing a who's who in the early church. Steve left off in the last show with uh, some of our early church uh, Christian father writers. And Steve, I'd like you now to pick up where we left off from show number one okay. on the who's who, you might say, uh, of a roadmap leading through uh, our early church fathers. And uh, just take it from there and, and, and show us the way, brother. Okay. <laughs> uh, in, in the early church, there were certain people who excelled at being called apologists. And the first apologists, when the Christians were being persecuted, they were people like Athenagoras in 177 A.D., and Quadratus and Aristides, whom we don't have as much on. But they would write letters to the emperor. And these would be like public letters. And they would say why Christianity is reasonable, why Christians shouldn't be persecuted. After all, if they accepted some of the Greek, Greek philosophers, some of whom were atheists, uh, they should accept Christians who believe in one God. And then they also showed why um, the uh, paganism of Roman and Greek and, and Egyptian was uh, foolish and silly. Now, maybe that didn't score them many points with the uh, pagan emperors, but, uh, but, but th that, uh, that's what they did. And they had some uh, very good arguments that were kind of refined later by later writers. Uh, an, uh, another early church father was uh, Theophilus, Bishop of Antioch. Now, Theophilus, um, he wrote, uh, he had, uh, as you can see, he wrote about 166, to, and he died either 181 A.D. or 188 A.D., we're not sure. He was the first person that we have on record to use the word trinity. Uh, and, um, and the way he uses it is kind of uh, in an offhand way, like he already presumed that his readers had, were already familiar with the term. So it had been probably used prior to that, it's just he, they weren't, you, you know, we, we, we don't have the written records of it. And, um, uh, but ever since Ignatius uh, and, and the earliest fathers, who we call Jesus is God and everything, it's like there was no, um, there was no d debate of, about the basic concepts behind the Trinity, but the word uh, itself, this is the, the first use of that. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, which is actually kind of an outpost of Christianity, you might say, in France, uh, he was an extremely influential uh, writer who was quoted by many early ones. And what he set out to do was to write a listing of every single uh, cult and other religion of his time. And it was quite, a, quite extensive showing all the, all the different groups and what was wrong with them and why Christianity was reasonable. And so his basic work is called Irenaeus Against Heresies. So you're basically saying Irenaeus was sort of like a first century uh, Walter Martin yes. uh, with his uh, Kingdom of the Cults, which right, right, became right, famous right. in the 20th century. Right, and, 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 <laughs> and, and for that time, written on the manuscripts, Irenaeus' work was pretty massive also. And, um, and, and he taught, and many, some of the groups we only know uh, from what, him, what he wrote. And also, he, Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who, if you remember, was a disciple of John the Apostle. <laughs> and Irenaeus had a disciple named Hippolytus. And Hippolytus uh, re wrote a refutation of all heresies, too, kind of like an uh, updated version of what Irenaeus did. And he wrote about a few other groups, uh, such as the, the, the Nicenae, uh, for example, and they're the ones who were who liked the who had the book the Gospel of Thomas, which uh, some Jesus seminar people today really like. And they were um, uh, 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 Hippolytus was aware of them. Irenaeus was not, and so we uh, conjecture that they probably started around that time and were not any earlier than that. Now that's interesting that you mention all that because uh, you know being a we're both Christian apologists. Mm -hmm. Apologist is not someone who apologizes for the Christian faith. We're, we're someone who defends the faith according to Jude 3 in the, in the Bible. But uh, when you talk about the 20th century, you've got Walter Martin with the Kingdom of the Cults. He put, came out with that book in the 1960s. But now the book has been revised by Ravi Zachari Zacharias uh, with some new input and stuff mm -hmm. uh, here to help the, the Christians deal with Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, uh, you know, Armstrongites, uh, Christian Science, New Age, all the things we deal with in this 21st century. Well, listening to you talk about uh, Irenaeus and then his, his, his man that came after him giving the, the kind of up the politics, kind of giving his updated information, it reminds me of what Christians still of this day do, dealing with all the heresies that, that are out there, all of the, the cultic groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it just shows, 
in another parallel, you might say, with early church history, that we as Christians are doing the same thing right. here in the 21st century that they were doing back then in their century, dealing with the heretical groups by different names. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, they, they've got these heretical groups. They don't call them Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't call them Mormons. They call them these other things. Yeah, but they're, yeah, still, but they're, really different. Yeah. they're still refuting them mm -hmm. from the Word of God, just as we do today right. as Christian apologists with these cults that use different names than they did back then, but it's still the same process. You're having to fight against people who would come against the Word of God and try to come up with different belief systems which, as we know from Galatians chapter 1, if you preach a different gospel than what the apostles or the gave you, like Paul said there in Galatians chapter 1, then you'll be, incur you'll be accursed. Mm -hmm. uh, the King James, you'll be cursed of God for going with a different gospel, a different belief system. That's why these types of things are so important. Well, anyway, I just had to throw in my not two cents worth, but maybe <laughs> I got it in a quarter there, but go ahead. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, the Christians basically had were had, had three fronts. They had the the uh, the cults that, that both the claim to be Christians and other other religions out there. For example, Hippolytus uh, even knew about the what he called the Brahmins, uh, which is really kind of a mispronunciation of Brahmins. And he talked about uh, uh, India and he talked about some Others in India that sounded kind of like yogis going around uh, naked and not eating meat and, 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 and very ascetic and things like that. Uh, so that, that was one front. Now another front is, a, is many of them were killed in, in persecution. So just imagine every 10 years or so your whole church leadership basically gets wiped out by being killed by the state authorities and you kind of have to kind of you know, grow it again. And then uh, uh, another problem, which we'll get into a little bit later, is uh, people inside the church with some, some schisms. And a schism is like uh, both sides are Christians, but they have a disagreement to where they divide and separate. We'll talk about some of the uh, maybe a little bit uglier things with that. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the next very influential church writer that we're going to just briefly highlight is Clement of Alexandria. Uh, and he wrote about uh, 193 to either 217 to 220 AD. He also used the word Trinity. He also wrote, wrote a hymn about Christ, uh, you know, praising him as God. Now, he tried to co-op the term Gnostic. Gnostic means like one in the know. And, and, and as we know from our previous program, uh, the Gnostics claimed that, that salvation was through the secret special knowledge, and they had this knowledge. And Clement would say, no, we are the true Gnostics because we're the ones who have the knowledge, not them. Um, so he uses the word Gnostic, but he uses it in a totally different sense uh, to say that the Gnostics are wrong and, and, the, and that we are the Gnostics. Beginning with Clement of Alexandria, you start to see just a little bit of maybe uh, focus on the church uh, versus maybe a little bit less focus on the Bible and, 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 and a little bit on the tradition. Some people would find he was maybe a little legalistic. Uh, with, with, with some of his stuff. Uh, if you, you know, uh, with Clement and later with Tertullian, uh, you know, they were against wearing women, women wearing any jewel, jewelry at all. Um, and, uh, and, and some of their other idiosyncrasies, but they really aren't found in the Bible. So things were just kind of starting to go maybe a tiny bit bad here, though, you know, I think Clement was a believer and they, you know, had good guys. Now, the next guy is a very interesting guy named Tertullian. Uh, really, he was a lawyer work as a lawyer uh, before he became a Christian and perhaps while he was a Christian too. And reading his stuff, you just kind of get the sense that here is a really brilliant guy uh, using, his, using his mind for Christ. Um, he is kind of the one most people think of. In fact, one book I read erroneously said that he was the first one to use the word Trinity. Uh, but he wrote a lot about it. Now, the reason he wrote about it is because there was an alternative belief called Sabellianism. Now, uh, Sabellians uh, have some similarity uh, in their belief about God to oneness uh, Pentecostals today, uh, except they're opposite in a few points. But uh, they said that, you know, there's only one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are God. So far, so good. Uh, but then they said that the Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, one form of, of uh kind of called modalism, said that they are the same. There is only one person. There is another variant form called dynamic modalism that says the Father became the Son, became the Spirit. But either way, they don't show a distinction. And so you just kind of just have to say, you know, at Jesus' baptism, uh, what happened? You know, when the Father spoke and the dove came down, 
you know, Jesus was not a, a ventriloquist and, 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 and Jesus was not a magician to like give the appearance of three and, and deceive all the people. There really are three distinct beings in one inseparable God. And, 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 and anyway, uh, their Praxius, who apparently was influencing the Bishop of Rome, was kind of bringing the church that way. And, and Tertullian stood up and said, no, this is wrong. This is what the Trinity is. And, and, and he, besides you know, showing from, from the version of the Bible, he also had a lot of illustrations. Uh, just, just for example, uh, basically put in modern terms, has anybody seen the sun? Has anybody felt the sun? No, you really haven't. The sun, 93 million miles away, you've never seen it. But what you have is you've seen the rays from the sun. Okay, you, 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 felt, the, you, you, you felt the heat from the sun. Okay, so has anybody seen God the Father? Well, directly, no. But Jesus is the image uh, of the invisible God. So just like we see the sun's rays, you know, we see the Father through the sun. Um, and, and just like we feel the, we, we can see the effects of God through the Holy Spirit working. And so those are like, um, you know, three parts. Uh, 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 they're, they're, not sep they're, they're not separated from each other, but, they, the, but they're actually distinct. And so he had uh, 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 some analogies like that. Um, now, Tertullian, uh, he called himself a Catholic because the word Catholic meant uh, one or universal and a part of the Catholic Church. Um, now, so you're, you're definitely making a distinction between that term Catholic and what's now considered Roman Catholic. Right. Uh, because when you say Catholic these days in the 21st century, usually people interpret that to mean Roman Catholic, right? But you're not you're not saying that at all when you use that term Catholic in this category. Yeah, and, and it wasn't me that made that made the distinction that Tertullian uh, was not a part of the uh, under the bishop at, at Rome. He he left that and he joined a different group of Christians who were called Montanists. Now the Montanists were um, had a lot of similarities to Charismatics today. They believed in prophecy going on then. The other church did not discuss prophecy or, or, or tongues or anything at all. Um, and, um, but it's curious, though, that back then, the Tertullian and the Montanists, they were the staunch defenders of the Trinity. And while most of the church was kind of silent and didn't say too much, the Church of Rome was kind of going the other way toward oneness. And so it was kind of the charismatics with, with Tertullian that kind of came through. Uh, and, 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 and help the orthodoxy there. So you're saying the church that was in the city of Rome at that time was actually heading in the wrong direction. Right, and, 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 and Tertullian uh, rebuked that. And it, was, and it was also soon after that time that uh, with the uh, difference in celebration of with the time of Easter, the church in Rome was tempted just to excommunicate all the Cordo de Simeons, that is the, the Christians who believe in celebrating Easter when Jews celebrate the Passover. So Hippolytus went and talked to the bishop in Rome uh, to resolve this, to say that both groups should accept each other, uh, despite that they had different views of when to celebrate Easter. And, you know, understand that you can still be Christians and disagree on secondary issues like this one. Mm -hmm. Alright, so, so all wasn't quite rosy back then. Uh, they, they agreed on the primary points, but on some of the secondary points they disagreed. After him, Probably the most influential person in early church history uh, was a very strange character named Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N. Now, Origen, uh, to give you an idea of his commitment to Christ, uh, when he was a teenager, his uh, father, Leonidas, uh, was martyred for Christ. And as his father was being martyred, he wanted to go outside so he could be martyred too. And his mother hid all his clothes so he couldn't go outside in public, so he wouldn't get martyred. And anyway, later, later on, uh, when he was a young man, uh, there was a wealthy woman who wanted to uh, support him because he had such great, you know, you know he was such a scholarly researcher, and she, and she also has some uh, translations into Greek of the Old Testament that we don't have today. And uh, Origen uh, was one who did manuscript study to try to say, okay, we have some variations in manuscripts, uh, which is the right one? Now, he wanted to live with her um, for some years to do this. Now, of course, if a single man living with a single woman, um, you know, even if he was, you know, pure, there could be like opportunity for talk and scandal. Uh, so Origen made a absolutely certain 
there could be no possibility of scandal. Mm -hmm. And um, I know what he did. Yeah, absolutely and surgically certain. Um, so whatever you criticism you have of origin, and I do have some criticism, you can't criticize his commitment to Christ. Um, so if anyone wants to know more about that issue, they can contact our ministry. Yeah. <laughs> What Origen did is he had something called a, a hexapla, uh, which was means like the six columns. And he had six columns um, for the, the, the books of the Old Testament. And he had all these markings to show, well, this reading is right, this re reading is highly suspect, things like that, just to get everything all straightened out. Well, in subsequent centuries, people copied the hexapla, but they didn't copy all the markings. So a lot of the stuff was lost, and we don't have all the columns of it today anyway. Uh, so we lost a lot of his research today, but at that time, the church in Alexandria especially had the benefits of his research. And so when people talk about the Alexandrian ma uh, family of manuscripts, a lot of them, those, that family will have the uh, influence of Origen and other people in Alexandria. And some of it is kind of like, well, do you think this influence is generally good or generally bad? Um, that might affect your opinion of how much you want to you know, rely on Alexandrian manuscripts. Uh, Origen uh, was uh, extremely influential long after his death. Uh, many Christians, uh, they would consider themselves Origenists, or we call them Origenists, and they, uh, because he had such a grasp of not only the Bible and the original languages, but also the Greek philosophy. Uh, he would go and talk to some of the Gnostics and some of the heretics out there, and they would become Orthodox Christians after they would talk to Origen. Uh, and uh, they translated his stuff into Latin so that the people in the West could get the benefit from it. Um, unfortunately, uh, some centuries after that, Origen was officially declared a heretic, Origen and all his followers, which included a number of people in the, in the early church. Now, the, some reasons uh, why Origen had strange teaching is that unlike uh, other uh, church leaders before him, he believed in eventual universalism. He believed that Christians who, uh, that, I'm sorry, that, that those who died and went to hell, and even the devil himself, after they'd been in hell for a long enough time, would, as, would eventually get to go to heaven. Okay, now this is not scriptural, and most people who were originists uh, would, would not hold on to his extreme teachings, but they'd say, well, he was so good in the other stuff that we'll just like, you know, downplay that and just do the other stuff. Another thing is he also believed in the pre-existence of souls. That, uh, that he didn't believe in reincarnation, uh, but he believed that people existed in, in heaven before they were born on earth. Um, and he also, um, on the Bible, uh, most Christians uh, wrote in a way consistent with that the Bible would be the inerrant word of God, though they didn't actually necessarily use that term. Origen believed that the spiritual sense of the Bible was always inerrant without error, but um, but the literal sense, he said, sometimes had, had, uh, had error in it. And so in those three ways, he was very non-standard, and eventually the, the, the church declared him a heretic, but that was like hundreds of years after he died, and he had a lot of influence before then. So some people say, well, the church started to go a little farther uh, off, you know, with Origen and, and, and his influence. So moving on, uh, soon after his death, uh, and by the way, Origen was never made a bishop, uh, because of what he did as a young man, they thought would be such a bad example uh, for, for, for others. That, and, and, and also he was uh, uh, first ordained um, in, in a different bishopric from where he was from, and so they were kind of against him for that. Uh, but anyway, at, after his death, he, he was admired everywhere, including Alexandria. And uh, Gregory Thamaturgus uh, uh, of Alexandria wrote a panegyric on, on Origen, just kind of praising Origen. And his close friend, Dionysius of Alexandria, uh, was a, very much an Origen also. Now Dionysius uh, was, had a debate um, in that Dionysius was sort of, either he was either an amillennialist or there really wasn't much distinction between amillennialism and, and postmillennialism. He had a debate uh, with people who were uh, premillennialists. And back then, premillennialists were Chileists. And Chileists were people who uh, said the earth is only going to be around for 6,000 years before the millennium. And they say it's probably 5,000 plus years old now, and it's won't be too long before the millennium comes. And he converted uh, two people, Bishop Nepos and Karasian, uh, to, to, to his viewpoint. And he also said that the book of Revelation uh, was written by John, but he's pretty sh he didn't think it was John the Apostle. He thought it might have been someone else named John. 
and and the other writers would uh, uh, that we had would affirm that it was John the Apostle, and Dionysius was a little different on, on this particular point. Archelaus uh, was a uh, Christian well-versed in the Bible who actually had a debate with uh, the other cultures, and it's called Disputation with Manus. And, and, and Manichaeism really wasn't a cult that claimed to be Christian. It was, well, it's kind of debatable whether it was. It, it, it was al almost like another religion, but it claimed kind of Christ as a part of it. And it had a lot of Gnostic tendencies in it, and we have that preserved, this debate. Now, whether this debate, is, some scholars think that, well, this might be kind of a mock debate where it was just written up later as if it happened, or it actually happened exactly as said, we don't know. But it is interesting to see both sides. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and after him was another guy named Arnobius. And Arnobius, his knowledge of Scripture, he didn't quote from it too much, but he really, really knew well uh, the, 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 the Greek and Roman mythology. And he used a lot of humor and also some harshness just to show how wrong it was. I, 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 as an example, um, what, it, it, if there are three or four different places that say that they are the, 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 the temple of Athena, and they have different conflicting views about where Athena came from and what she was like, when somebody made an, a, a sacrifice to Athena, um, are they going to... Um, uh, are the Athenas all going to come and they're going to have an argument over uh, which Athena that sacrifice was to? <laughs> uh, Methodius was, uh, um, extensive, was who wrote extensively and, and he basically corrected Origen and his followers and shown that they were, they were wrong. Uh, Lactantius was a uh, very eloquent speaker who was a tutor of one of Constantine's sons and he wrote the Divine Institutes, kind of a uh, very uh, smooth uh, uh, um, kind, of, kind of distillation of all of uh, Athanasius wrote a lot after Nicaea, but we include just the things that he wrote before Nicaea because he was a pretty outstanding person even before uh, the, the Arian heresy in, in Nicaea. I got you, Steve. Well, that was a good run-through, but of course we've run out of time for this segment of this series, but we'll continue this series in this road, road map, you might say, through uh, early church history and the writers and the theologians. Uh, but for now, if you have more information that you'd like to acquire about this subject, just contact our um, address, phone number, our, uh, email us at the end of the show. Uh, check out our websites, biblequery.org, historycart.com, uh, to get additional information as well. Well, I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers with Steve Morrison, our Director of Research. Great job as usual, brother. And uh, join us again next time as we continue in this series on early church history as we move through and contrast what early church history tells us compared to what a lot of other strange religions are telling us now. With that said, God bless you all. Join us next time. Bye-bye. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 